Hi, Glenn here, the People's Carpenter. This is a project that turned out to be kind of ridiculous, but it was a, a great learning experience for me. Um, before I get into it, though, I do want to say thank you. This is a new channel, obviously. I started, I, my mind is foggy already, a couple of weeks ago, and I have really been um, buoyed by the people who have been commenting, the people who have been watching, the people who have been subscribing, even the people who have been coming to say, commenting to say negative things because it means you watched at least enough of my video to have an opinion and you bothered to say something and that helps me. So look, I do appreciate it. Um, without further ado, because this video is much longer than I intended and I will be apologizing numerous times for that, let's get underway. I'm building a can crusher. So I just wanted to say a couple of words, and I'm not at all getting paid to, to do any of this. I didn't get this coffee for free. Um, I just got an email uh, the other day from Coffee Supreme, which is a brand of coffee that I quite like, and so I get their promotional emails, and when they have good deals, I go and buy stuff. And I saw, and this is empty by the way, the, the coffee beans are now in my grinder. <laughs> Some of them have found their way into my cup. I saw that they have this promotion. They have a coffee here which is called Kōrero Mai. Now Kōrero Mai is in the Māori language, or what we call Te Reo Māori, and it means talk to me. And it's a promotion where the, the proceeds that they make, uh, that Supreme Co Coffee Supreme make on this Kōrero Mai coffee, goes to the Mental Health Foundation here in New Zealand. And I thought, that's kind of a cool thing, because just in the same way, well, not just in the same way, but, you know, I think that, that um, artistic expression and doing things in a workshop, for example, are good for mental health, and, and a coffee also tends to facilitate good talk. So I bought some, because I think that's a really great cause. And if you're in, in New Zealand, it may be a cause that you're interested in supporting as well, especially if you're a bit of a coffee fiend like me. But... I thought that was worth commenting on. Well done, I think that's a, a case of kudos to you, Coffee Supreme. Um, I've discovered some, I don't know, you might call it a design issue, you might call it a miscommunication issue, because when I saw this, the description said that it could be mounted on the wall or on a table. And I thought, well, I'm not going to mount this on the wall, but not on a table either, but on a nice wooden block. That's not quite how this is going to work. It really is only designed to be mounted on a, on a wall. It can only be mounted through screw holes at the back. I can't imagine ever screwing something with big screws like this onto a wall, at least not in, not in your home. So I thought, oh no, is this just going to be a wasted well, it was only about 15 bucks New Zealand, so not hugely expensive, but is that just going to be a waste of m money and time? And I don't know, because I do think it's cool. I think it would be fun in a guy sort of way to crush cans. So I thought, look, if I'm going to make this work, it's going to be a kind of a monstrosity of a thing, although I can make it a nice looking monstrosity. Is that a contradiction in terms? If I take some pieces of recycled rimu and make something with a, with a not a hugely long base, but with a, a base and a, a wall section that stands up and I can attach this and then it can sit on my bench. It would need to be a sufficiently long base that it wouldn't rock too much when you pull the handle. I could make that work. It would have to be high enough that you could get a, a small bottle under it to open. I mean, is that becoming a monstrosity at that point though? But then I suppose it can go up against the wall, stay out of the way. It, it seems kind of ridiculous as a project now, just because this isn't quite designed the way that I thought it was, but let's just do something, and, and if this video turns out to be okay, and it turns out to be a, a semi-beautiful object, then I'll publish it. I guess if it doesn't, I'll publish it anyway, because sometimes we fellas have bright ideas that turn out, turn out stupid, <laughs> and you're not the only one. So, I'll start by prepping this wood. In online woodworking forums, 
I see a lot of, of conversations, more than they need to be really, with people getting hung up about what type of glue to use. And that passion is sometimes not not coupled with, with knowledge. And so, for example, you'll hear people saying, you should never use Gorilla Glue because Gorilla Glue is expanding foam glue. Gorilla is not just one type of glue. They do make a polyurethane glue that does expand as it dries, that's true. But they make lots of other glues as well. They make super glue, you know, contact adhesive. They, I think, I have a few varieties of PVA glue. And so just to demonstrate that Gorilla Glue is perfectly good to use in woodworking projects, I've got here some Gorilla Bonded On Aliphatic PVA Glue. Trouble is, am I running out? No, good. Okay, that seems like it should be a perfectly good glue joint. I was just lifting it up to check that there's a small amount of squeeze out on both ends on both faces, I should say. Now, as much as I might enjoy taking old bits of rugged timber and recycling them by planing and jointing and gluing them up and basically making beautiful, nice, new looking bits of wood, um, right now is where the real action starts when it comes to me learning new things because I've done this a thousand times. I haven't, however, done much by way of joinery. And that's what I need to look at now because what I'm going to want to do is join these two pieces of wood together like that. And some of you old experienced hands will look at that and you will immediately say to yourself, ah, I would use a whatever joint to do that. But of course, I don't have that kind of experience. So this is all about me learning and you're along for the ride. So how am I gonna join these two pieces of wood together that way? Well, I do have some professional assistance from a fella named Terry Knoll, who has a book called The Joint Book, The Complete Guide to Wood Joinery, which sounds a lot like what I need. So come in a bit closer, we'll talk about this and we'll begin properly planning this. So these pieces of wood are arranged in a T orientation. And there's a helpful section of this book where the author looks at all the different possible orientations that two boards might be in when you want to join them. And then he suggests the types of join that would be most suitable for that orientation. Now, for a lot of T joints, the most appropriate join would be a mortise and tenon, but this is a little bit problematic for that because that usually happens when your T-joint is like that, or like that. But the point is that the long edge of the end of this board runs along the grain. So you get a tenon like so. Uh, sorry, a mortise like so, and a tenon like so, of course, because they have to match. And that's not what I've got here. You see, my initial thought before I gave much thought to it was, well, that's fine. What I'll do is I'll just cut a mortise and tenon joint in here, but the mortise will run across the wood that away. Hmm. There are some issues with that. So imagine for a moment that this piece of green tape is where my mortise would be cut. Ignore the fact that it's not quite centered. It's just to make the point. Now, normally what you do when you cut a mortise is your chisel cuts will be like so, as you remove material from the mortise. But when you do that in this orientation, the edge of the blade of your chisel runs along the grain. And so if you put that like so and give it a good pound, what could happen is that you could split the grain and the split could run outside of where you want your mortise to be. And obviously that's no good. The wood would split along the grain, you see. And that's generally why people don't do that. Um, the other shortcoming of this way of doing things, because you could get around this, you could just drill out or route out that mortise and then tidy up or pair off the, the um, wood that you don't want around the edges. And that would be a way of cutting the mortise but it also wouldn't necessarily be an ideal glue join because um, the glue up would be against 
that edge and that edge primarily and that will be end grain and an inherently weak joint which is not ideal I mean it may be that it's tight enough and there's enough gluing strength on the ends for that not to matter but it's not really ideal you know I do want to learn traditional methods to begin with and that's not really the most straightforward traditional way of cutting a mortar so I want to start there and then break the rules later once you've got the basics sorted and that's not really the basic way to do this so uh, so I probably won't do that the trouble is if you don't do a mortise and tenon joint but you want to join your boards this way well what other options are there well the the author suggests two other kinds of joint one is oh, you can tell he's American because he says housed rabbit <laughs> in the anglophone world we would say say housed rebate but the idea there is that you have what he would call a rabbit or a rebate or basically a kind of a dado a channel cut along the width of that board and then you would remove some material here and then that piece would sit in that channel and you could glue it up thus uh, so that would have been an option but, but not really for see as a joint that would largely rely on its gluing strength and again every glued surface would be against end grain so that would be quite weak as well um, the other option suggested here is housed sliding dovetail <laughs> now I laugh not because that's a bad idea it sounds like a perfectly good idea that's where I would cut a dovetail I would remove these bits cut a dovetail shape so I'd kind of have a have a tenon with dovetailed edges so I would have this long dovetail and then I would have a dovetail shaped channel like so cut all the way across and then I would once all the cutting was done I could slide this in and then yeah the glue joint would be quite weak because you would still largely be dealing with end grain but there'll be so much uh, tension if I get this nice and tight and you couldn't pull it out or knock it out easily because of the shape of the dovetail that would work but the trouble is I'm just a beginner when it comes to joinery and um, that's fairly advanced for me um, I don't even have a dovetail router bit which is how I would be most inclined to do that and I just don't want to do that so if, if I want something a bit more basic what are my options see this is the planning level that I'm at now uh, what am I going to do here well I do like the idea of doing a mortise and tenon and there's enough width here that what I could do hmm, is this getting a bit silly and ambitious I'll continue to use tape just to illustrate what I could do now these are not centered in any way this is just me thinking on the fly <laughs> what I could do is two mortises side by side now they're in the right orientation and then I would cut two tenons into the end of this board actually yeah now that I think about it from a mechanical point of view I think that would be the best thing to do trouble is it's not simple why do they have to start doing this <laughs> why couldn't I just be basic in my approach but that does seem like the right joint to use here for me given my skill level which is quite low so I'm not going to attempt the sliding dovetail and that looks like it's probably the way to go uh, all right that's what I'll do now I'm gonna for dramatic effect take the chisel away to emphasize that planning is everything and before I even think about using the chisels I need to have everything fully marked out how am I gonna go about this I think I'm gonna want the can crusher on this side I'll give it a little bit of space and I'll just mark out where the top piece will sit that seems like a good place to start so that rectangle there is my top piece the conventional wisdom that I've seen around is that you should cut your mortise before cutting your tenons 
Incidentally, in case anybody anybody wondered why I had this used popsicle stick, I was using it as a bookmark, and it just fell out and was sitting on my bench. Maybe you weren't wondering. Okay, so marking tools. Obviously pencil, marking gauge. I don't have a specific mortising gauge, which, I don't know, might be useful, but I don't have one. Square. And... <clears throat> Not quite a not quite a large expensive enough tool to justify its own unboxing, but I rather like that. Looks like a weapon. Okay, so I use that after I've laid some things out. Now what size should my tenons be? Because hmm, everything's a little bit different. Because there are going to be two tenons side by side, so some of the ordinary conventions won't necessarily apply. So I guess I can just kind of make it up. <laughs> no. See, I've made a mistake here. Because I've already said that my mortises should be the width of my mortise chisel. And my largest mortise chisel is 12 mils. There we go. Almost made a, made a noob mistake. So what I'll do is I'll use my chisel. Yeah, that's better. Now in principle I want them to be fairly large. So I will have fairly small shoulders of just five mils. Yeah, marking out isn't really that exciting, is it? Especially when I'm focused over here and not talking to you. My eyes are not what they used to be. Maybe I should be wearing my reading glasses. Those are my mortises. Now I didn't actually use this. Maybe I should have. Yeah, see, another mistake. That's the reason for these things, just to make sure that your lines are parallel with the edge of your piece of wood. Now, it could be that it is. Now that, yeah, that does actually look okay, I think. Yeah, looks like my measuring was okay, but I, I really should have gone with that to, to cut that line. I say measuring, my measuring and, and turn. Measuring and marking was okay. Um, now I'm not going to put this in the vise because it is a fairly hard wood. And see, with soft woods, if you put them in the vise, the chisel when you when you whack it will just cut down into the wood. The harder the wood, the more likely the piece of wood is to move down in the vise when you whack it. So I'm just going to clamp this here on my bench. Although what I should do, what I should do before I do any of that. Let's mark the mortise on the other side so that I don't have any blowout. I can actually make some cuts on the other side as well. Good, everything seems to be lining up. That's nice. Up. Now, it took me a little while because it's the first time I've ever done what I just did. So bear with me. I do apologise if that was a bit boring. I may, um, in retrospect, speed that up. But I think we're ready to go. We're ready to chop. Another unboxing. This is the hammer that I'll be using. I do look around to see what other people are using. I haven't seen anyone actually using this brand, but I've seen people using tools very much like this. This looks a lot like Paul Sellers one, but I don't think uh, he uses Thorex. Thorex is the brand I've got. It's a decent weight hammer. I forget the exact weight. It's either 750 grams or 900, somewhere in that range. And it's got nylon faces. 
I don't want to go damaging my, my chisel. So if I have this right, I'm not going to start right on the edge there because that bevel, as it chops down, will push the blade that way slightly. So I'm just going to... I'll just start out that way. I'll start there to be safe. These are all new experiences. That's actually, it's actually very satisfying. And I can now feel some of the things that I hear the experts talking about, where each successive chop feels like it goes a little bit deeper uh, more readily. And I guess that's because this stuff has less resistance, so it can push its way past it and get further down. Now I'm going to turn the chisel around now. So I don't want to I don't want to leave her back too hard against the edge of the mortise while there's still lots of material in here because I don't want to damage the, the edge. Now I'm not, although I guess it sounds loud, I'm not really walloping this. I'm being somewhat cautious and that's just a Oh, just a measure of my experience, <laughs> or lack thereof. All right, let's um, turn it over. This feels like it's taking a long time, but I am comparing my performance with that of people who've been doing it for decades, and this is New Zealand Rimu, which is quite hard wood. <laughs> now, do you know why? <laughs> this is hilarious. You know why I haven't met in the middle? It's because... So I'm chopping on that on that mortise, then I flip it over and I keep chopping in the same place, but of course it's it's the other mortise. <laughs> so no, I won't have, I won't have met in the middle yet. <laughs> oh dear. Some of you will have spotted that. Why didn't you say something? <laughs> oh well, no harm done, I suppose. That's more like it. Now I'm cutting the right side. I have gone all the way through. Okay. So the good news, it doesn't look like I've, I've cut that too small on the inside. So what I'll do, I'll do it tomorrow actually because it's quite late at night, is I'll come in with a different chisel. I'll use one of my well, I'll choose. I might just use a bevel-edged chisel and pare away the inner walls of that to make it a bit more respectable and finish, finish chopping that mortise. So that was a bit slow, but my first time cutting a proper mortise like this and every time I chopped and saw how the wood responded, you know, I was gaining new information as I went. So all things considered, I'm, I'm fairly happy with that. Looks a bit messy now. Once I'm done pairing that, I think it'll look a bit nicer. I don't know why, but pairing just seems to feel far more natural when the chisel is horizontal. Maybe it feels more natural to some people that way, but I'm just going to do what seems right. And I'm told that one of the ways to avoid tear out or blow out on the line is number one, to have the line cut as I have, and number two, to make sure your chisel is nice and sharp, which is always a good idea anyway. It's more difficult to pair 
the ends of the mortars because I'm cutting across the grain. Okay, I think I have cut out enough. Look, um, is it perfect? No, absolutely not. But um, for my first ever mortises, I can see there's a few bits of fluff. I'm very happy with that. There should be a good solid gluing surface along the inside walls of that mortise. preserve my original measurement using this device and immediately transfer it onto the piece for the tenon. I'm um, on the side of making my tenon ever ever so slightly too large because you can make it smaller but you can't make it bigger. That's what she said. The only real hesitation I had about doing a double mortise and tenon was the fact that I've got this piece in between the tenons to worry about. It's easy enough to saw in from that direction, to saw in from that direction, but what am I going to do to remove that? We'll find out shortly, I suppose. fully marked out. Ah, time to cut these. Now, <clears throat> I'm waiting for my tenon saw to arrive because I had that saw, you may recall, in the unboxing of the chisels. It is not a tenon saw. So as soon as that arrives, I will unbox that quickly and start cutting. I've recently done an unboxing of my Japanese Ryoba saw. And while I wait for the Western style tenon saw that I've ordered on Etsy to arrive, I decided that I would use this to cut this tenon because, well, I found it to be a pretty decent saw. Although like all saws, it's not magic. You still have to be careful and do the work yourself. A trick that some people have suggested to avoid cutting your finger like I did when I unboxed the saw um, is to use a block with a good vertical surface to keep the blade up and down. I watched um, Jonathan Katz Moses and I've seen some other people do this as well where they put their thumb next to the saw to keep it upright, which is fine. Um, unless you're cutting very deep, then you need to remember to take your thumb away, which some people do, I guess, because they end up using two hands because I didn't take my finger away. I was using my finger and it rubbed against the teeth there and cut my finger just a little bit. Fortunately, this is also a um, this is a flush cut Ryoba saw so that the teeth are not set to the left and to the right. And these, so these teeth are just sticking straight up. So they did less damage to my finger than they might otherwise have done. Enough about that. I'm gonna try this method because it seems to make sense. I know, I'll, um, I'll collect the cro cut, cross cut teeth first to establish a cut line. You see, the one thing I lack is experience. Maybe I won't keep it there, just because I physically found that awkward. And what I'll do initially is peer over the top of this wood and look down the line here to make sure that I'm cutting slightly to my left. And now we'll do the same on this side. Seems to 
do the trick. Now slowly. So far so good. Pulled it out too far. I need to remove the waste between these two tenons so that I can then proceed to pair the tenons down to their final shape. And I've thought about a, f a few ways of doing this. You, power tools would be perfectly fine. You could drill or route that out. That would work. Um, I'm trying to be a bit more old school about this. I could have slid the, the blade of a coping saw down there and cut along there. That, I guess, would work fine. I see people do that a lot with the waste between dovetails. But that's, that's just not what I'm going to do here. Instead, I've just taken a bench chisel and I'm going to try to remove the waste this way. So there is some further final tidying to do in there, but I'm going to treat that as roughly right and I'll turn my attention to pairing these tenons into shape. Right, so here's where I need to be fairly slow, not too zealous. So I'll start by comparing my tenons with my mortises and that will show me where I'm too wide and uh, too thick. I suppose that's the thickness, not the width. And I'm too thick everywhere, which was the plan at this point. Uh, so I'll go slowly and constantly compare my, my tenon to my mortise to make sure that I'm not going too far. A few tools that I can use for that. One of them would involve an unboxing and I don't want to do another unboxing. So I'm just going to go in with my widest bench chisel. I'm not even using my nice bevel edge chisel. This should be perfectly fine. 25 millimeters, which is just shy of an inch. Taking off 
probably not even a millimeter. No, not even a millimeter. Maybe, well, possibly not even half. So it's going to be a repetitive process of just taking a little bit more off then comparing. Okay, so I'm close enough, and I can see I'm not quite there, but I'm close enough on this side that I don't want to take any more off just yet. I'll be taking a bit more now off that side. side so I'm being a little bit more aggressive but I don't want to let that get away on me now, this is going to be a fairly long video I know because some people make a whole video just about cutting the mortar so I haven't dwelt to that extent on every part of, of, of doing the mortise and tenon but I guess I'm just saying I'm sorry, it is fairly long and that's that. Okay, I'm looking good now on that side. So I won't subject you to this whole process because as you can see, all I'm doing is shaving a little bit off, comparing it to the mortise, shaving a little bit off and then, and then so on. Oh, we're coming right down to it. It's, I don't want to force anything or do any damage, but I can see there's just a tiny amount to take off, and I'm going to use another tool to help me with that. This is what's called a chemically polished file, uh, also called an Iwasaki file. I believe it's of Japanese origin. And what it consists of, it's very unlike the typical files that are made in the West. Each tooth of the file is like a tiny little planar blade and so you get a very smooth finish as a result it doesn't take off a lot this is a fairly fine version but I think they're all fairly fine and I'm just going to use that to shave off the tiniest amount from this tenon and all sides of all the tenons You can use this to tidy up the inside of the mortise as well if it looks messy in there. And I'll show you the finish I'm getting. That's like it has been taken to with a scraper. It is very, very smooth. Quite. I actually think this tenon here wants a bit of tidying up, so instead of, sorry, mortise, you can just see a little rough spot that I think may be getting in my way. So, um, and it's just going to be a matter of going back and forth to each part that looks like it's causing the problem and doing a small amount of work. I'll use this file again. Are we ready? I think we may be ready. I think we may be. This is terrible, <laughs> like really bad. Um, I suspect it's going to be just a matter of tidying up the shoulders around the tenon, but um, this is Gap City. Um, so it's not perfect. 
And it could just be because of some forces going on inside the mortise there that is stopping this thing from sitting flat. But it's not quite, I mean, it's sitting fairly flat, but there is a gap along here. Do I want to go and fix it? Uh, maybe I do want to go and fix that. Yeah. But, I mean, check it out. Because of the length of the mortises, that is a really, like, I'm not easily able to move it this way and that way without rocking the whole object. So that's pretty good. But yeah, I, I am going to just take it apart again and just do a little bit of cleaning up inside the mortises. See if I see if. See, see, I don't want it to become looser though, that's the problem. And how am I doing in terms of, in terms of an angle? Yeah, okay, so whatever these forces are, it's being forced that way ever so slightly because that's not quite a right angle. Yeah, I will do that. Should still be okay, this stuff lasts for ages if stored well. Some Norsky epoxy resin glue. actually acts like a lubricant but I don't suggest you try using it as one and what I will do is bust out my heat gun to soften this stuff to encourage it to run down into every available hole which yes exactly the effect that I would have hoped for. Now that looks terribly messy now. It won't soon. So this is frustrating. I didn't intend to go that deep, I just wanted to make a nice round over like this. Okay, so what happened is, there are a couple of methods you can use to adjust the height of the router. One is the plunge setting, so you plunge it down and then when you've reached the bottom of the where you want your plunge to be, you lock it into place and, and do your routing. And the other is, in theory, a, a slightly more precision setting where you grip that handle and lower it to the desired depth and then you can dial in exactly the right depth and I kind of thought that meant that it would would stay in place it would stay at that depth um, and you wouldn't have to do the, the the normal locking that you would do when you were plunge routing because that's quite a different operation but no I realized that um when you just by gripping the handle to move the router around your workpiece you actually move the bit quite a lot. I mean, it doesn't look like a lot, but when you're doing a, what's supposed to be a, a fairly precise piece of work, that's a lot of movement. And so it's dug down much deeper than I had intended it to, much deeper than I had set it to go. And now I realized, oh no, you do still have to lock it down as though you were plunge routing. Uh, so I'm just going to have to make this a feature. <laughs> Come back later and give it two more coats.
well. <clears throat> that works perfectly. And uh, you can just tell that there's no, I mean, obviously there is the force of the handle, but this thing is well up to those forces. That join is super strong. And you know, that, um, that, that, that thing that I wasn't too happy about that I made into a feature, that um, that profile that I had to put her into the put into the edge actually looks quite good. It does look intentional and and it now looks more like something you might want in your home, I guess. Okay, but this video this video has been more than long enough. I didn't intend it to be that long. And that's because, you know, I initially just thought it would be a little a little block that I was making, kind of a board, a platform for the crusher to go onto. But then I opened it up and I realized that I was dealing with a, a slightly different object than I thought it was, so I had to come up with a bunch of plans. And immediately the thing just took off in a bunch of different directions. I had to plan what that joint would be like. First of all, I had to sort of think about what kind of object I would have to build to make this thing work. And then I had to think, okay, so if I want to put these pieces of wood together, what kind of joint am I going to do? Because I haven't actually got to the point in this channel yet where I was going to seriously say, okay, let's do a mortise and tenon because I'm still a newbie. So I sort of threw myself off the deep end, not with just a mortise and tenon, but with a double mortise and tenon. The final result of which is fairly good. Now I know that if I was a professional carpenter, I would be unhappy with that because there are issues with it. You know, like that line there looks good. That line there, not so much. There is a gap. You know, I need to, I'm gonna have to get better. I'm gonna have to practice at making the shoulders nice and flat. I'm definitely going to have to practice cutting the tenons and, and, and chopping up the mortises. The tenons weren't quite long enough. I'm not sure how that happened. I guess it just happened by me cutting them too small. Um, I also need to really work on my sawing. Uh, I, I, in particular, see most of the sawing was okay, but in particular starting off the cut. If you're cutting a, cutting a tenon and you start off the cut in a messy way and it's a through tenon, then you're possibly going to see the result of that messy start on the end of your tenon and to some degree I can. But just generally, that's gonna come with practice. For a first time, that's okay. You know, it's, it's, Everyone has to start somewhere and compared to how this could have gone well <laughs> I'm pleased with it. Is it a monstrosity? Is it a stupid thing? Yeah, look it kind of is It kind of is I don't think that I would have bought the can crusher for this project had I realized what it was going to be because I don't know it seems like a silly idea, but you know, I mean nice wood looks nice and this wood does look nice and it works, <laughs> and I may even use it in my kitchen. So, you know, a monstrosity it may be, a ridiculous project it might have turned out to be. I've learned a lot. Um, see, if this was a very standard project, like a tabletop with breadboards, even though that's a bit beyond me just yet, or, you know, a charcuterie board, or something that has been done a million times and there are established methods and traditions of doing it, even though it's a more complex piece of work, I probably could have done it simpler because that's a path that's very well worn. And that I guess, that I guess is the benefit of tradition, both in woodwork and like maybe in life in general. You know, where it's a thing that's been done a million times, there is a way of doing it. But when it's something like this, you kind of think, okay, how on earth am I gonna do this? And you have to think about it. I guess that's why um, bespoke pieces of of carpentry and woodworking that are designed around a, a one-off purpose just cost more because there's much more planning involved. And that's something I've learned. And this has been somewhat enjoyable. Uh, I hadn't intended it to intend it to become this monster, but there we are. The first project is done. Thank you for sticking it out if you did.